this with me this evening and turn over to hymn number 196. 196. One ninety one. Please ask the blessing over the offering. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we 
do come before your presence, Lord, to worship and serve you, the living God, to say thank you for the salvation that you provided through the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that we can gather together and sing songs of praise to you and worship you and hear your word preached here tonight. Lord, we ask you now to use this offering, use it for your glory and honor. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. seated and turn over to hymn number 147. Hymn number 147. Turn over to hymn number 129. Hymn number 129. Yes, sir. 
appreciate the songs and the singing. And if you would, let's take your Bibles this evening. Go to the Gospel of John, chapter number 9. The Gospel of John, chapter number 9. <clears throat> John chapter number 9, whenever you find your place, I'll invite you to stand with me <clears throat> one more time this evening as we honor the reading of God's Word. And we'll look at a good bulk of uh, chapter number 9 and the different um, relationships that are going on uh, in this. And, and really through chapters 9 and 10, it's hard to be able to take any of this apart. And, uh, and of course, we typically do that. But, uh, but anyway, we're going to be taking apart or looking at it as a whole and, and a lot of the events that are taking place here. So chapter number 9, verse number 1, first word is? Uh, that's a good one. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither at this man's sin nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed, and came seeing. I want to bring our message this evening of blind from birth. Blind from birth. Let's pray. Father, again, we want to thank you for this day, for allowing us the great opportunity to be in your house. And Lord, we pray, Father, that you uh, would use this passage, Lord, to draw us close to you. And if there's one here that doesn't know Christ as Savior, that today would be the day of salvation. Help us to be able to see the wonderful truths that you have laid before us this evening. And we give you the praise for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please do be seated. So through the Gospel of John, We've been able to see a great number of miracles, different events and interactions and, uh, and things that are going on. But there's also the exposure of the spiritual condition of the Jews. And we've been able to see that throughout. And he's painted such a great picture for us in every different, uh, in every chapter about where they were uh, spiritually. Uh, the Pharisees, they were supposed to be uh, the spiritual elite. They were the ones, if you've got a Bible question, they were the people that you were supposed to ask. And yet where we left off with last week, they had reject the sayings of Jesus. And uh, remember what that meant, the sayings of Jesus. It was talking about his message. It was talking about his doctrine. And so they, they were not receiving what it was that Jesus was giving uh, to them. So we were able to see that great phrase also last week that, that uh, is only used in the Gospel of John. Remember it's used 25 times in that Gospel. Who remembers what it is? Oh, there you go. Thank you so much. I was like, we're going to have to do a repeat. So verily, verily. And remember the significance of that phrase. Uh, we talk about it. it. Well, yeah, it means truly, truly. But remember every time that that phrase verily, verily is used in the Gospel of John, uh, that it's always speaking of eternal truth. It was not just random statements. It wasn't just Jesus saying, well, here's some stuff, but this, this is really true. Uh, no, he's, he's given the fact of, he says, it's true now. It's true for eternity as well. They were eternal promises of God. But the Jews, uh, they weren't interested. Now think about that. Man, we look at that and we're like, wow! I hope you went home and studied it and started looking them all up because you, you get excited about that and you're like, man, God's got something special in store for us whenever we know these things. But the Jews are hearing the eternal word from the eternal word and they're still not very interested. We left off with, with Jesus uh, down in verse number 58 of chapter 8. He says, Verily, verily, I, I say unto you, truly, truly, I say unto you, before Abraham was, a uh, good eternal truth statement right there, amen, I am. And you know, in, instead of being excited, very next verse, they took up, uh, they, took, uh, they took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them, and so he passed by. So, uh, so here's this great eternal truth, and they don't want to receive it. Uh, they're, they're getting ready to cast stones at him. Very important that we, uh, that we see that. Now, the temp why is that? Uh, the temptation is, is we get to chapter number 9, we got this whole new account. We look at it, we're like, well, it's a different day, uh, different things that are going on, different person, different interaction that's there. We got the blind man here, we got a whole different story. Chapters 9 and 10, they go together. That's what the preacher said. And so uh, all of these things are there, but we're going to miss something very important if we separate it. And that's the importance of that word that you said when we started. Very first word of verse number one, and. 
That's a connecting phrase. That's a connecting word. It's a conjunction. He's saying, he says, all this stuff was going on here in chapter 8, and then we get to chapter number 9. So there's a comparison that is being uh, taken place that we really need to be able to see that connection. In chapter number 8, I'm not going to go through all of it, but just as a reminder, in chapter number 8 we saw that Jesus was the light that exposes the darkness. Chapter number 9, he's, he's communicating sight to one that's in a permanent state of darkness. Amen. That one that's blind, man, he knows exactly what darkness is all about. Chapter number 8, uh, we, we left off. The Jews were stooping down to pick up some rocks to throw at Jesus. Chapter number 9, Jesus is stooping down to get some clay to be able to anoint the eyes of the one that's blind. What a difference. Man tries to use God's creation to bring about the death of the Savior. That's what they were interested in. But Jesus uses his creation to bring about, uh, to bring one to, that was defiled to the fullness of life, the fullness of understanding. In chapter number 8, the people were rejecting Jesus. Chapter number 9, you know what you're going to see? You're going to see this man that was born blind adamantly receiving Jesus. Chapter number 8, Jesus hides himself from the religious elite. But chapter number 9, he opens himself, he reveals himself to a blind beggar. Chapter number 8, he, he goes into the temple, and remember what they did? They called him a demoniac. Chapter number 9, he's outside the temple, and they called him the Lord. All of these contrasts give us a real picture of the character of the saved man and the lost man. He's given us a great picture of what the natural man is all about. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 14 says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So then, what was the response to the Lord? I mean, boy, it seems like they're just not interested. They keep rejecting him everywhere that he goes. He's gone to the temple. They don't want to even recognize him. They're okay with going through the feast. They're okay with going through the, the rituals and the ceremonies. But here he is, the, 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 the Son of God comes into the room, and they're not interested in him at all. So what does he do? Does he just go around? Does he leave? Uh, does he turn his back on all of them? Not at all. He just continues looking for the individuals, looking for those that are interested in him, and that's where we get kicked off a little bit. The first thing that we see here is the way that Jesus sees. The way that Jesus sees is so much different than the things that man often looks at. Verse number 1 in our text it says, And as Jesus passed by, it says, He saw a man which was blind from his birth. I can't imagine that. It's hard for me to imagine what it's like for somebody that's blind. You've, you've known people that are, uh, that are blind, and, and especially they've been born that way. It's, it's hard for me to fathom what that really entails on a day-to-day -day basis of, of not just getting around, but the things that they've, that they've never been able to see. People that are born blind, such as this man, think about well, uh, there's so much that we take for granted whenever we look around. The, the porters have a son-in-law we've been praying for. They woke up one day, couldn't see. And uh, they say it's some kind of a palsy, some, uh, <clears throat> something that they're looking at with a optical nerve issue that's there. And, and so they said that they, they feel like his vision is going to come back, but it may take a little while for it to be able to get to, that, uh, to get to that point. But I just can't imagine somebody that's never been able to see. Imagine this man, he says he's born blind, he's never seen a sunset. Never seen the beauty that's there. He doesn't know what colors look like. If you tried to describe it to him and you said, well, there's, there's all these rich orange colors. What's orange? I don't know what orange is. You know? And so he's never seen that. Uh, he's never, he doesn't know what his mother and father actually look like. Never seen their face. Not only could I not imagine what it would be like, but it would be really hard for me to sympathize with someone that was going through that as well. I don't know what to say. What do you, uh, what do you say? I, I don't know. And even if, even if I were blind myself, I couldn't sympathize with somebody else because i got my own problems to deal with. Hey, Amen? It's like, you blind? Me too? Are you kidding with me? Are you blind? You know, hey, can you imagine if you were really blind? You're like, you're, you're just messing with me. You, know? you, you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know how to interact or any of those things. And yet, that's the way we see things. Jesus was different. Jesus was interested in meeting the needs of others. He could even meet the need of this man. It's a man that had never seen, had difficulties beyond we could ever imagine. But whenever Jesus looked at that man, he saw a man, he says, you know, there's somebody who's never been able to see. You know, whenever, uh, whenever the Lord looks upon the heart of man, he sees that as well. 
He sees whenever a soul is still covered in the darkness of sin, they've never received Christ as Savior, they don't know what it means to, to understand the spiritual life as well. You know, from a spiritual application, we can go back to the time whenever <clears throat> Jesus was meeting with Nicodemus. We, we're not going to rehash it all, and I know you can go, whoo, but John chapter 3, remember in verse number 3, Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, except a man be born again, he says what, he shall never see. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Now think about that. He says, unless you're, unless you're born again, you can't see. On the spiritual side, you need more than just a capacity for light, being able to go through your eye hole. The natural man is spiritually blind. It means his understanding is, is darkened. You know, there are those great metaphors that are all through Scripture that talk about what that means. But Ephesians 4, verse number 18 says, Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of of their heart. The physical blindness of this man. You know, we look at it and we say, boy, this is, this is a great account of Jesus being able to deal with someone who was physically blind. But it's also giving us a picture of how it is that Jesus deals with a person who is spiritually blind as well. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because the Gospels uh, record more about blindness than any other affliction. Any other affliction. There's one account of one that was deaf and dumb that was healed. There's one account of that was sick of the palsy. There was one account of one that was sick of the, the fever. There's two accounts of lepers being healed. Uh, there's three uh, that were raised from the dead. But there's five that were recorded with blindness. I always think that's interesting. There's five if you're a numerology type of person. That's a picture of grace through the Bible. Amen. I love that. Plus this, this blind man in our account... On top of the blindness, well, he's also a beggar. He said, well, of course he is. He didn't have to be, right? He could have had a rich family. He could have had all of his needs met. He could, have, uh, he could have been taken care of very well and all that, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that he was, he was a beggar. That means he didn't possess anything of his own. His whole existence depended upon the charity of somebody else helping to meet his need. Can you imagine that? It's one thing to be blind and not being able to see anything, not being able to fulfill a task, especially during the time, not having uh, anybody that's going to invest in you and teach you how to do a trade. He's, you know, there's a lot of, the, you know, he's probably not going to be a blacksmith over there and <laughs> dealing with, you know, 1,500 degrees or something like that. That's probably not what he needs. Probably not going to be shoeing horses and, and things of that nature. It, it, was, it was a trade-driven uh, society, and there was going to have to be a lot of, uh, of investment in somebody to be able to teach that trade. Most people aren't going to do that to a blind person. So it's one thing for him to be blind and not being able to see that there's going to be any kind of a, a change that's going to come about in his life, but he's also gotten to the understanding that this is the way life is. He's just gotten to the point where he said there's not going to be any difference that's actually going to be made. There's nothing that can be done to be able to help. And so every day, day by day, he's hoping that somebody charitable is going to walk by to put a little bit of money in his hand so that he'll be able to eat. That's his whole life. He was dependent on others. He was a picture of helplessness. And get this, that's the way it had been since birth. Can you imagine? Can you imagine going through your whole life and thinking, you know, nothing's really going to change. And yet Jesus looks on a man. You know, uh, people look at that, and, and probably that blind man, those were the things that he was thinking. I, I doubt very seriously, this is just me speculating, it doesn't say this, but I, I doubt very seriously that the blind man sitting over there saying, you know, there's a lot of medical marvels that's going on. I bet somebody's going to be able to restore my sight. Maybe if I got some of that eye salve from Laodicea, uh, you know, that everybody's so big on, maybe that will restore my sight. I, I think he'd probably have given up on all that. I think he'd gotten to the point where he was resolved that's the way that it was. And by the way, his parents, that's the way that it was. His friends and family, those that were around him, that's the way it was. It was just the old blind guy. We don't know what his name is. doesn't even tell us. I mean, if anybody even paid attention to what his name was, he's just, he's just the blind guy. But then whenever Jesus sees him, he says, nope, that's a man that I can help. You know, it's amazing how God does that. Whenever you start looking at the things from a spiritual perspective, nature. There's, there's probably people that you know that you've given up on. There's probably people that you know that, that you look at and you're like, man, their lifestyle, this is what they do. Boy, nothing's going to change. That's just, it's just going down. It's, it, it, what a hardship that they have. And that, you know, it's, it's all this stuff that's in their life. You know, Jesus can change all of that. Amen. We had, we heard one of the greatest, um, testimonies, um, 
when was that Friday night uh, Friday night we went up there was a, a lumberjacks for life meeting and and uh, anyway we got some tickets to it and and uh, but we got to go up and there was a lady that was sharing her testimony and and um, I, I don't have time and uh, anyway see me after and I'll give it to you or Miss Kim will and uh, but anyway it was just one of those things I, I'll, I'll give you the brief one all right <clears throat> I don't even know how I can make it brief because it's all just awesome. I mean, absolutely incredible. But, but it came to the point where she was going through and, and she was describing uh, her background. She says, statistically, she should not have been born. Uh, statistically, her, her mother wanted to be a doctor. Her mother got pregnant. Uh, statistically, all these things were going against her. She, she could have faced that option to abort, but she didn't. She, she chose life. And, and, uh, and, and, anyway, and then this, uh, this young lady got saved. I think it was 16 maybe, 16 years old, sounds right, and uh, whatever it was, she got saved. And then she was able to lead her mother to Christ about a year later. She got saved. Their whole family changed around. Now this lady, she's got uh, three kids. One's an engineer, one's a doctor. Her mother wanted to be a doctor, but her couldn't, but her, grand, her granddaughter ended up becoming a doctor. And, uh, you know, and all, I mean, there was just all of these things. And, and the whole point to all of that, making this very brief, is that Jesus is the one that makes the change. Hey, man, it's not a matter of just saying, well, well, you know, as long as you get on the other side of the tracks, you'll be okay. The other track, the other tracks are just as sinful. Amen. Listen, I don't care what side that you're on. The need of every person is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that looks at the real need, and he's the one that's got the answer for the need. Amen. So about the time that we start thinking, well, it's just some old blind guy. No, no look at him the way that Jesus does. Amen. Secondly, there is the confessions of men. <laughs> the confessions of men. Now, right here, here's the disciples. Here's the disciples. Look at verse number two. His disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? If you wanted to take lessons on pity, this is probably not the guys to talk to. Amen. They didn't look at the man and said, Lord, is there anything that we can do? Lord, you, 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 you multiplied the loaves and the fishes. What if we got a loaf for this guy? Lord, would you, would you be willing to just meet his, maybe give him a week's worth of bread? Lord, could you break that much for him? They didn't do that. Their first words show they were more concerned with what type of sin that, that man had been in than to get him to the right place. They put more interest into the suffering than the cure. They looked at all of the, the inequality of, uh, of human life, and they recognized, you know, everybody may, may go through some hard times and that kind of thing, but probably if you're going through hard times, you brought it upon yourself. I mean, because some, some people are blessed. Some people's got a lot. Some people got a little. It's probably something you did. So they had the same thought that uh, if there was somebody going through that hardship, it must be because of their personal sin. And the disciples, they're looking at this man. They're walking by. They're seeing one who's in sin. He says he brought it on himself. It was, his, it was his own punishment. It was his problem. There's a real danger whenever we try to theorize about somebody else's life to the degree that we become indifferent to their actual need. Amen. What's the actual need? They need the gospel. Yeah. Amen. Sin is still sin. And I don't really care exactly what the depths of that sin is, but every person needs the gospel. Uh, every person is going to go to hell without receiving Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, whether they sin a little, sin a lot, sin a sin that you like, or sin a sin that you don't like. Sin is the cause. So regardless of what a person is enduring, we should be looking to give them the good news. You would think that the disciples would know that, right? I mean, here they are, they're walking with Jesus all the time. They're seeing him work. Don't you think after a while you'd start saying, you know what, I bet Jesus probably wants to help somebody. But do we? Yeah. Amen. Listen, if we know Christ is Savior, we're walking with him all the time too. We should be trained to do that exact same thing instead of picking somebody apart and able to say, you know, I bet they need Jesus. Amen. Jesus has an answer for them, as he always does. Amen. Check it out, verse number three. Jesus answered, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. This man wasn't born blind because he sinned in the womb. Isn't that amazing? I mean, have you thought about that? Lord, which one sinned? He was born blind. <laughs> what are you trying to say? In the, you know, in the womb, he's in there trying to stab somebody. You know, what do you mean? He was sinning in the womb? Uh, no. But that's what they're asking. And, and Jesus says, no, that didn't happen. He says, by the way, neither did his parents. His parents' sin didn't affect him and, and cause him to be blind. Now, all, all suffering <clears throat> is ultimately 
You can carry it back, and it's going to be because of sin. Amen? Uh, if there was no sin, then we wouldn't have any suffering, wouldn't have any uh, uh, death, and, and all of those type of things, wouldn't have any afflictions. But he was telling them that, that there was not one specific sin that led to that child being born blind. It wasn't like it was a punishment from God on his family. The Lord is, is very politely rebuking them for having a hard heart. All the suffering, all, all hardship, it's not always related to somebody's sin. Amen? Now, if we're not careful, we can fall into that same trap and say, well, I wonder what they did. wonder what they did. And it certainly can. Uh, God doesn't want His people to get settled into the thought that we can uh, uh, have this righteous judgment of God, though. He, we, certainly, sin has repercussions. Amen? Well, uh, you know, you smoke a, uh, four packs a day. Well, you know, lung cancer is a high probability. Amen? I mean, those are, those are some of the things that are there. We understand that. But, but we, we don't just look at it and say, oh, well, they had cancer. It's probably because they sinned. That's not the way that it means. You know, it's funny because whenever we start doing that, then we start putting all of the uh, interest and emphasis, and this is where that righteous judge comes about. It's like, well, I already know what's going on in their life. No, you don't. No, you don't. You have to be very careful that you're not putting yourself in the place of God. You know, that's kind of the way faith healers work. You go to the little faith healer, they just happen to go in some little podunk church out in the middle of nowhere that you've got to drive 45 minutes to see daylight. And then they come in and they're like, we're going to have a healing crusade and I'm going to touch you and you're going to be healed. And if you weren't healed, it's because you didn't have the faith to believe. Yeah. And now all of a sudden you've got a guilt complex because you didn't have enough faith to be able to go with what they were. They're being charlatans. Anyhow. Jesus said, this man was born blind so that the works of God should be manifest in him. God has his reasons why some people have sickness and some people have ailments. That's right. And we can try to do all that we can to be healthy, and we should. That's called being a good stewardship of our life and health. We certainly should. But there's going to be some things that God may allow so that he'll ultimately get the glory for it. You know, in Scripture, we saw that in Lazarus. Lazarus uh, was a great illustration. John chapter 11, we hadn't got there yet in verse number 4. But Jesus heard uh, that he was dead. He said, that sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Remember the Apostle Paul? The Apostle Paul besought the Lord thrice that he had removed that thorn from his flesh. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And that's true for this man that was born blind as well. Jesus goes through and he says, no, you got the wrong idea. He said, you're trying to assign some kind of a sin to him that, that didn't even exist for him. He said, that's not what it is. That he, he says, I'm going to get the glory out of this man's life. Now, how's he going to do that? Because all through chapter 8, he's been rejected. All through chapter 8, he's gone through explaining about who he was. They wouldn't have anything to do with him, and they're ready to throw stones. But he says, oh, I'm going to show them something right here, and it's going to be very pointed as we start looking at it. Jesus had a work to do in this man's life that nobody was going to be able to deny. They, I mean, boy, the, the, blind, the most spiritually blind should be able to see exactly what Jesus was doing here. But it would also uh, set the, uh, the disciples on course with the ministry that they're supposed to have as well. So he's, he, you know, Jesus is forever the teacher, amen? And so he's using this whole thing, and he's, he's going to be showing those that doubt. He's going to be helping the man that's born blind, and then he's also going to be teaching those that need to be teaching others as well. So he's doing this great work. So here's the uh, <clears throat> verse number five. We start looking at the work of the ministry. The work of the ministry. In verse five, he says, As long as I'm in the world, oh, watch this, I am the light of the world. Now that's a great confession because Jesus was going to be going back to heaven and his disciples were going to be continuing the work. Amen? Good to be able to know who he was. Jesus said back in Matthew 5, verse 14, he says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. We're to be sent out by God. We're on a mission. We're supposed to be ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. Our light is to shine brightly, and our light should be shining brighter and brighter the closer and closer we get to seeing the Lord again. Jesus is using this event to be able to teach the disciples how they are to be the witnesses that God would have for them to be. It's a great teaching moment. So notice just a couple of things as we look practically at this man and how it all goes down. So look at verse number 6. 
It says, when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. And he went his way, therefore, and washed, and came seeing. Now think about what he's doing. Why would the Lord restore a person's sight in that manner? That question was actually posed to me this weekend. Why would the Lord do that? What, what did he, now here it is. <clears throat> he took clay and spit. That's not what you would expect. No. You know, as a matter of fact, much like the Pharisees would probably be thinking, we would all look and we're like, Lord, yes. that's the way. That's right. <laughs> you, you know, it's just kind of beyond what it is that we would, <laughs> what we would think. Yeah. Why would he do that? Maybe, just maybe just to show that he can do whatever he wants. That's right. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> You know, if you've ever, uh, it's interesting whenever you think about this whole thing. You ever gotten dirt in your eye? Yeah. Amen. You know that that's bad for you. Yeah. I mean, by all accounts, it, it's, it's not good. Why? It hurts. Yeah. yeah. And, and then you know what happens? You get the little grain, you can get one little grain of speck of something. You can't even see it, especially when it's in your eye. And that thing just scratches up the lens of your eye. You ever get scratches on your eye? I mean, for, for two days you wake up and your eyes all crusty because you got goop that's running, because it just burns. Oh, it's horrible. It's the worst feeling. Now, here's Jesus. What is, what is clay, by the way? It's dirt. Amen. And he says, I'm going to make a dirt compress for his eye. He says, I'm just going to wet it down a little bit with spit, and that's what's going to, that's what I'm going to use. Now, we always need to start with the right context, right? So whenever you're looking at why would we do that? In chapter 8, what had happened? In chapter 8, Jesus was rejected as being the Lord. Matter of fact, if you look back in chapter 8 real quick, in verse number 12. Now, this is going to sound strangely familiar right here, okay? Now, remember, remember that little word that y'all helped me out with? And... All right, so this is a connecting phrase here. The things that's going on in chapter 8 and chapter 9, they're related together. Chapter 8 and verse number 12, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Now watch this. I am the light of the world. He's the light of the world. Go down to verse number 15. He says, Ye judge after the flesh. They, uh, he's the light of the world, but the people were judging according to their own flesh. They weren't judging according to spiritual things. They were, uh, they were uh, uh, trying to make him fit into a mold that was, uh, that was of their own making. If you go on down to verse number 40. Verse number 40, <clears throat> he confesses something else. He says, But now you seek to kill me, a man that had told you the truth which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham... He says, you know, uh, they, they treated him like he was a man and not God. They just said, you know, yeah, okay, the teacher aspect, but he's not deity. They were, uh, they were not discerning of spiritual things. Now here it is, back in chapter number 8, he started it off. He says, listen guys, I'm the light of the world. I'm the light of the world. And they said, no, 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 it doesn't match our mold. No, I don't think it is. I mean, we think that you're a man and not God. We don't think that it's right. You're not doing things the way that we want them done. And then we start out in chapter 9 and verse number 5, and he says it again. He says, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Now watch this. Now watch this. Immediately after he says this, all right? So this is cool. He says, I am the light of the world. He pronounced it there. He went through and tried to explain it to him, and they rejected him. Now he's, he's, he's talking to this man, the blind man. He's outside the gate. He says, I'm the light of the world. In verse number 6, watch this. He says, when he had thus spoken. Now what does that mean? It means right away, immediately, here was the deal. He made the statement, and now this took place. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground. Made clay of the spittle, he anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay. Isn't that something? So he says, immediately, this is what it is that he does. A and he does something that nobody else would do or could do. Amen? He says, I'm the light of the world. Watch this. Yep. He told him before, I'm the light of the world. Let me explain everything to you. We're not interested. 
I'm the light of the world. Yeah, we're children of Abraham. I know what you're talking about. I know that you're the seed of Abraham, but you're not, you're not spiritually related to Abraham. If you were related to Abraham, if you believed, if you had faith like Abraham, you'd do what Abraham did. But he said, you're not of Abraham. He said, Abraham would listen. He says, I know Abraham. And they're like, oh, no, we're picking up some rocks. He said, we're, we're not going to have any of that. And here it is. He goes through the midst of them. Here's the blind man. He sees him. He sees the need. The rest of his disciples are looking at him. He's like, I wonder what sin that he did. He says, no, I'm about to get some glory. And he says, hey, I'm the light of the world. Watch this. And he starts picking up some dirt. He used the substrate that was used when Adam was created. Yep. The dust of the ground. You know, it's pretty awesome whenever you see the Creator God. He said, let there be light. And there was light. Yep. He, he, whenever He formed Adam, He formed Adam out of the dust of the ground, and then He breathed into His nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And He says, here's a man who's, who's blind. He says, let there be light. I wonder how I'm going to restore it. Let me scoop up some of that dust to the ground. And I'll use that as my my work. But the man, he still couldn't see. He says, when he, at verse 6, he said, when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, made clay of the spittle, and he anointed his eyes of the blind, uh, blind man with the clay. Verse number 7, it says, and he said unto him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. And he went his way, therefore, and washed, and came seeing. He couldn't see right away. Couldn't see. Isn't that funny? He says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Now, why would he do that? Here's the reason. Here's what it is. This is what he did. Uh, he said, obey. Yep. Obey. You know, anytime you, you see Jesus, whenever he would meet, uh, oftentimes whenever he's meeting with the people, he's, he meets them differently. Every person, every need. Now, he could do it the same way, amen? I mean, if he wanted to, he could go around with a big old pack of clay, and he could just say, oh, you got a broke leg, let me rub some of that on there. Uh, you got some bad eyes, let me put that on. Can't hear, you know, and here he goes, smack some clay in there, go walk. He could have done it all the same way, but he doesn't do that. What does he do? He's always meeting people on a one-to-one. -one. He's always showing that he is God. But you know what will happen? What will happen is, is he always commands them to do something to demonstrate their faith. He'll say, uh, he'll say, reach up to me. He'll say, look at me. He says, I can't do it. I mean, think about the, the, uh, those with a palsy, uh, those that are, that are uh, 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 paralyzed. He's like, well, I can't do anything. You can look, can't you? Yeah. Yep. On, That's what he's doing. And, and whenever he's saying, he says, listen, uh, there is something you can do. And, and here it is. He puts the clay on. He says, you can't see yet. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. What's he telling him to do? He says, obey. 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 Now, some people take that out of context and they say, I wonder if you've got to be baptized to be saved. No! Uh, first of all, the very simplest form is that you're not going to have one passage that's going to speak about baptism whenever there's you know, a dozen other passages that say that salvation is by grace through faith and not of yourselves. Yep. But the issue was always about obedience. What was the obedience he was calling them to do? He was calling them to be obedient to the Word of God. Amen. That's who he was. Amen. They just had to be obedient to the word. Now, here's the thing the Jews had a problem submitting to the word of God. They always liked to think that they were doing their, their own thing and they didn't have to submit. They had their own way of doing things and that's the way it was supposed to be. The Jews had that problem with it. You know, Paul warned about that as well. Uh, over in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 26, he was actually uh, given that instruction about <clears throat> how uh, the Lord loved the church. And, uh, but he's saying, you know what, uh, there's a bit of a warning in there about how it is that we are to be presented to him. In Ephesians 5, 26 it says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word, so that he could present that church to him, a, a perfect church. That's what it is that the washing of the water of the Word has to do. The Jews would not obey the Scriptures, so their eyes and their hearts stayed closed. He said it all back in chapter number 8. He says, I am the light of the world, and yet they're still walking around in darkness because they would not obey the Word of God. Look back to chapter 5 right quick. Chapter 5. All the way back to chapter 5. The Jews 
or seeking to kill Christ because he, he made himself equal with God. Do you remember that? I know it's been a long time ago. Look at verse number 17. He says, Jesus answered, he says, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. <clears throat> Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, which was their day, which that's what he's doing over with the blind guy, by the way. He says, But uh, said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. He says, man, uh, he said, do you know what he said? He said God was his father. That means that he is going to be equal with God. And what did he tell him to do? Go down to verse number 39. He said, search the scriptures. They said, no, no, you, you're making yourself equal with God. We're going to kill you. And he said, what's the answer? Search the scriptures. Man, get into the Word of God. Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. There they which testify of me. Look over to chapter 10 real quick. Keep going, going to you right. Chapter 10. We're going to go down to verse number 31. Now let's start. Uh, verse number 25. Jesus answered them, <clears throat> I told you, and ye believe not, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe them not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Then, watch this, here they go again, amen. The Jews took up stones again to stone him. They, were, they wanted to kill him. And the Lord said, why do you want to do that? Why would you want to kill me? Look down to verse number 33. And the Jews answered him, saying, <clears throat> for a good work we stone thee not. That's what he asked him in verse number 32. He says, what good work are you going to kill me for? He says, not for a good work, but he says, but for blasphemy. And because that thou being a man makest thyself God. Think about what Jesus says. Verse 34. Jesus answered them, is it not written? You know, what's he doing with the Jews here? He keeps showing him, he says, I'm the light of the world. I am the Son of God. And they reject him. And he says, and then he goes back and he says, what does the Bible say? Right. And then he comes back again another time and he says, I, I'm the light of the world. I, I, I'm the Son of God. He says, are you kidding me? You're trying to make yourself equal with God? Get the stones again. I've still got mine all polished up from last time. And, and he says, no. He, he says, uh, what does the Scripture say? Right. What does the Bible say? What does your law say? It's all testifying of Jesus. Yeah. And they hadn't been able to figure it out yet. Jesus wanted the people to obey the Word. Chapter 9, go down to um, verse number 39. Verse number 39. Jesus said, For judgment I am coming to the, this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. The disciples are seeing all this. And they're seeing something about their own ministry. They're, they're seeing all of this unfold. Listen, everything that Jesus has been showing him, that's what I'm saying. Uh, you, got, you can't hardly take away chapter 9 from chapter 10. The, the two are playing on each other. And you can't take away chapter 9 without understanding chapter 8. Hey Amen. He's been building it all the while saying that he is the son of God. And, and they wouldn't hear him. They wouldn't receive him. And, and he says, you're missing out on the whole plan that I've got in store. And he's using this blind man as an illustration. The disciples are looking at him. They're like, who sinned so that this man's born blind? And he said, no. He said, you got the wrong idea. He says, I'm about to get glory out of this man. I'm going to use him as an illustration of everybody that I said in the temple. I'm going to use him as an illustration to all that going forward. He says, this is what it is that I came to do. I can do what no man can do. Go back to our text. Chapter 9, verse number 8. It says, the neighbors, therefore. <clears throat> so here's the man. He's, he's got his, his dirt com, uh, compact there, and he's, uh, he's all healed. He's been washed. Uh, he went to the pool of Siloam. He obeyed God. He came back. He was able to see. Now then, everybody's going to start talking. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, hey, He's like him. But he said, the blind man said, I am he. I love that. So the, the blind beggar, he had a, a great change take place in his life. And now all of a sudden he's got the neighbors. 
The neighbors, the neighbors are supposed to know you. Hey, man, neighborhood watch. Everybody's watching your stuff. What's the neighbor doing? But then they see him in a different, uh, different setting, and they're like, oh, is that him? And somebody said, yeah, yeah, that's, that's Bill. I mean, he's been, that man's been blind his whole life, but there's Bill. He's walking around. He can see. And then somebody else says, no, 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 no. It just looks like him. I mean, now, I don't know about y'all. I would have probably been that guy. I said, no, nah, it can't be him. I know where he sits. Hey, Ben, you want to miss with a preacher? You just sit in a different spot. You get visitor cards. <laughs> you, you just sit in a different spot when we had free mugs at, at Easter, you know, and it's like, hey, I need a new coffee set. You know, you just never know. So some were saying, yeah, that's him. Some were saying they just look the same. And the man said, it's me. He was this way. He says, I am the guy. The Pharisees didn't believe it. The Pharisees started questioning. Let's look at it real quick. Verse number 13. They, uh, they brought to the, the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. So the formerly blind guy still doesn't have a name. Amen. But he says, this is the guy. He used to be blind. Now he's not. And so he aforetime was blind. And it was, uh, it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened the eyes. Now there's the big catch right there. You know, it just happens to throw in. It's like, oh, this is the reason nobody's rejoicing. And it's amazing. It's whenever the Pharisees get involved, it's like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. He did that on the Sabbath day. That ain't right. So, and they opened his eyes. And, and again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, he put clay upon mine eyes, and I washed, and do see. I like that. Amen. Therefore, said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God, because he gave not the Sabbath day. Others said, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. They say unto the blind man again, what sayest thou of him that he hath opened thine eyes? And he said, he's a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind. And he received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. So here's the Pharisees. They're looking and, and they call him over and they said, hey, uh, what happened to you? He says, well, the guy, he says, man, he, he, he came, he put the, you know, he, he did it. Here's what he did. I, I went, washed, now I can see, uh, just plain and simple as that. And, and they looked at it and they're like, no, nah, that ain't right. No, nah, we, we don't believe you. We, we don't believe that's what it is that, that's happening at all. As a matter of fact, he said, how is that even possible? Because he did it on the Sabbath day. That's their defining point. They're like, wait, nobody can do that on the Sabbath day because that's the day that we said was going to be set apart. We don't do anything on the Sabbath day. How does this guy think that he is above the Sabbath day? Surely not. Surely not. You know, um, some folks still feel the same way today. Some folks feel... They're always trying to find the loophole about why it is that the Word of God can't be true today. doesn't matter how much evidence is there. You know there's plenty of evidence that proves the Word of God. There's the geological evidence. It's, you can look all through the Grand Canyon. Say, well, over billions of years, or one big event called the flood. Amen. There's archaeological evidence of the kingdoms. There's prophetic evidence of the coming nations and the Messiah, which is Never once been proven wrong. Not one missed prediction. There's over 20,000 known documents that support the New Testament. There's historical evidence about the Jewish historians like Josephus about Jesus. There's the obvious evidence in the Word of God that you have the privilege of being able to hold in your lap today that was assembled over 1,500 years, over 40 different penmen on three different continents and three different languages, and yet it all flows just perfectly well, all because the author is God. And yet there's many that question because they won't exercise faith in what is known. So the Pharisees question it. Then they call the parents. They say, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're not going to take your word for it. They're talking to the guy that was blind. They've got people that are bringing and says, here's the, here's the guy that was blind. And they're like, we don't believe you were blind. What kind of idiot would do that? I've been faking it all my life, just trying to get some handouts for free. I've been eating gravel, you know, for all this time. That's the good life, I tell you. That's better. It's like, who would do that? But he says, no, no, no. We're not going to believe until we hear from the parents. So his parents come. Guess what his parents? His parents are mastered by fear. Go down to verse number 19. 
Verse number 19, we're almost there. <clears throat> Verse number 19, they asked him saying, is this your son whom you say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered, uh, answered them and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. <laughs> Something about that. Is just, it's kind of like one of those uh, deals where they're bringing somebody, you know, against Congress or whatever. It's like, is this right? It's like, we know that's our boy and we know he's blind, you know, and that was it. So verse 21 says, but by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or whom hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age. Ask him, he should speak of himself. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, said his parents, he's of age, ask him. Now remember the neighbors of the blind man, they couldn't even attest whether they even knew him, that he was indeed blind, and, or if he was their neighbor or whatever. Certainly the parents knew. Certainly the parents had a good understanding. The, 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 the man's parents, they didn't try to drop the acquaintance. They didn't walk up and say, I ain't never seen the boy. Never seen him. I mean, I don't know, I don't know what you're getting at, but not our kid. No, he said, he is our boy. And he was blind, and now he can see, but we're not saying the name. We're not saying the name because they feared the Jews. And they didn't want to, they didn't want to miss their time in the time in worship. They allowed that fear of the Jews to motivate how they testified. They simply ignored the question. They said, he's of age. Ask him. Then <clears throat> They said, okay, we'll do it. So here we got the blind, blind man coming back. So verse number 24, verse number 24 says, then again, call they the man that was blind, still doesn't have a name, amen, the man that was blind, and said unto him, give God the praise. We know that this man, talking about Jesus, we know that this man is a sinner. And he answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Amen. There's nothing commonplace about what happened in that man's life. You know, it may be that the neighbors didn't even pay attention to him. They couldn't testify. It may be that mom and dad were too scared to be able to go out on a limb and, and living in fear and, and just hoping that everybody would stop asking him. But this man, this man said, I lived in darkness too long. I lived not being able to see a sunset, not being able to see my parents' face, not being able to see the color orange. He says, I'm not going to deny the one that changed my life. I'm not going to deny the one that took me from darkness to light. Amen. And he proclaims the name of Jesus. And he doesn't care who knows it. You know, Jesus became the most important person in his life. And I like this, the, the disciples, they're learning their lesson. The disciples are watching it all and they're learning their lesson about what real ministry is. Look at what he says back in verse number 10. He says, therefore said they unto him, how are thine eyes opened? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay, anointed my eyes, and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed, and I received sight. No dissert, big dissertation about himself. He didn't go through and say, Well, I'll tell you, I always sat over at the gate. I'll tell you, the north side of the gate, that's the best place to be. Man, that's where you can get a little bit of shade some of the day. And there was the one day I had my cup of coffee. He didn't talk about any of that. He didn't talk about any of those things. He said, I was blind. He said, Jesus came along. Jesus made the clay. Jesus anointed my eyes. Jesus told me to go to the pool of Siloam. And I just did what he said. I was blind. And now I can see. They asked him again. He says, I don't care if you believe me or not. I won't denounce him. I'll live for him. And God got the glory. Can I tell you, if you're here and you're not saved, you know God can get the glory out of your life. Right. All you have to do is recognize Him. He is the King of kings, and He is the Lord of lords, and He is the one who will turn your darkness to light. He'll set you on the right path. If you're saved, God has shown us, boy, there's a ministry we need to be involved in. Amen? It's Jesus that makes the difference. Let's stand together. We'll have a hymn of invitation. Our Heavenly Father, God, we want to thank you so much for this passage that you show us. We thank you for all these chapters and the opportunity that you've given us to be able to study through and see the, the whole account of the story and, and the things that, um, that you do. Father, I thank you, Lord, for salvation. I thank you that we can look to you and live. We can put our trust in you and honor you. 
Lord, the, the, low, the lowest of sinners can come to Jesus and recognize you and by faith receive the forgiveness of sins and, and be made a child of God. Oh, Lord, I pray, Father, that you would burden our hearts about the wonderful ministry that you give us, Lord, to be able to lift up the name of Jesus. God, I pray, Father, that we would honor you at this time and, and truly search our hearts and our lives, Lord, and desire your presence, and, Lord, that you would do a mighty work in our midst. We just want to thank you for it and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hymn number 261. 261.